We all struggle with feeling like there's not enough time in the day to be productive personally or professionally. We all struggle to make our time matter. It's time to take control. It's time to start investing in the corporation of you. At Athena, they've helped over 700 ambitious professionals achieve more by connecting them with best-in-class globally remote executive assistants. Athena executive assistants go beyond basic administration tasks. They help you make time matter through the art of delegation. They believe delegation is the superpower of all highly successful people. And your personal EA will help you get there. Your EA is a one-on-one long-term partner to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. Take back your time. Join the waitlist at athenago.com. That's athenago.com. I mean, no one plans to get sick. And yet, here we are. My name is Matthew Zachary. A quarter century ago, I was given six months to live with a diagnosis of terminal brain cancer. For more than 15 years, I've been ranting and raving on the air about stupid cancer and now stupid healthcare, and I'm just getting warmed up. So let's all go make healthcare suck less together because you know what? We're all out of patience. Hey, that's the name of the show. Hello, friends. Welcome back. Got a good show for you today. Dr. Teresa Brown, RN, a nurse, a PhD, author, New York Times bestselling author of that. She joins me today to talk about her third book, Healing, When a Nurse Becomes a Patient from Algonquin. Yes, when the cancer nurse becomes the cancer patient. She has a phenomenal sense of humor and an incredible perspective of, again, as an oncology nurse, how the inner workings are what they are. And when the coin flipped on her life, what it was like to be literally a fish out of water while still in the fishbowl. You know, one might think that being a nurse in oncology before you get cancer could be to your advantage, but uh -uh -uh, not the case. Among the many things we talk about, besides telling really bad dad jokes about nurses and medicine, are things like caregiver burden and survivor guilt and scanxiety and and the contest that really shouldn't be a contest about stage one, stage four, I'm better than you, I'm worse than you. You only had three surgeries, I had nine surgeries. This very well may be the first show I've ever done that channels fast times at Ridgemont High and Ferris Bueller through the lens of nursing and throwing tons of shade at Grey's Anatomy at the same time. Oh, one last thing. We had a couple of sound glitches and tech issues during the show, so please forgive any blips, bleeps, and weird stuff, and all praise our producers for making the magic happen. So without further ado, I present Teresa Brown. Enjoy the show. Teresa Brown, Nurse Brown, welcome to Out of Patience. Thank you for having me. My first question, how many Teresas do you know without the H, and are you offended? <laughs> or is that a Shonda? <laughs> I have met quite a few, and in fact, there was another Teresa Brown in my high school without an H. Are you kidding me? I'm not. I mean, I, and, I, at one point, there were like four Matthews in my fourth grade class, but my last name was the only last name of that letter. At least, yeah, you lost that bet. Yeah. And in fact, I get Google alerts for Teresa Brown, and there's a lot of Teresa Browns. That's incredible. My my first grade crush was Teresa, so it's it's a special name in in my backstory. Aw. <laughs> well, I'll try to be as as charming as a crush worthy first grader. <laughs> you're you're gonna channel real hard. She was a she, she's still around. We're still friends. It's interesting. Like forty billion years ago in first grade, like, I got a crush. Look at that. Nice. I want to start by what's the darkest inappropriate nursing joke you've ever told? Oh my gosh, I don't know if I could tell that on your. I mean, we're all supposed to be angels and heroes, right? Right. How about I, how about I give you one of mine? It's not that bad. It's just it's a it's probably a joke my daughter would tell me if I told her to go look up nursing jokes. What did the nurse say to the man who fainted in the airport? I don't know, sir. I'm afraid you have a terminal illness. Oh, <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> I love it. All right, I, I'll, I'll tell the inappropriate one because I'm channeling Gilbert Godfrey this week for some reason. Why did the COVID ward have the fastest Wi-Fi? I don't know. It had too many hotspots. Oh, uh, actually, I thought of now a great and appropriate nursing joke. Oh, do tell. Please do tell. Okay. So um, this is actually one a medical examiner told me. So it's kind of a medical examiner joke, too. So he said it's a crime scene. 
police there, people in all their, you know, white suits, just like on TV. And the medical examiner goes up, kind of looks at the body and says, okay, well, one thing we know is this was a nurse. And someone else says, well, how can you know that? And he says, well, it's obvious. The stomach is empty, the bladder is full, and the ass is half chewed off. Oh, my God. (laughs) God. All hail misogyny. That's that's a good one right there. I love that. That's fantastic. I told a non-healthcare person that joke once, and I think it's hilarious. And she, she was really horrified. <laughs> you know, it's like you're the nurse that got cancer. Congratulations. But the humor of it all is kind of what keeps us together. And uh, when I started my nonprofit a million years ago, which was probably 10 years out of when I had cancer, we, we leaned into the darkest comedy ever. We had a T-shirt that said, ovaries are for losers or who needs nipples anyway or, you know, bald is beautiful. We had one that said um, something like uh, just like Animal Planet, but with better genetics or something like that. More hair, different mm-hmm. hair. It was the humor. Did all right, I'm going to move ahead to go back. Did you find the humor in this or was it tragedy the whole time and what the fuckery the whole time or like where did it get to you like this is so inane I have to be comical I mean sometimes I found the humor I did I at a, a very dark moment I was looking up pictures of women who'd had mastectomies which I, I do not recommend to anyone and I did not need a mastectomy so but I might have if my genetic results had been different they were great but Anyway, one of the shirts, one of the pictures I saw was a woman wearing a shirt that said, of course, these are fake. My real ones tried to kill me. (laughs) I remember that shirt. Yeah. But mostly I found the situation macabre. And and since we're, we're already going all inappropriate here. Yeah, it was more like what the fuckery, as you said. Yeah. So we're going to talk about your book in the second half of the show. I want the listeners to get to know who you are. You already said fuck twice, so you're in the club. Boom. (laughs) The book is Healing When a Nurse Becomes a Patient from Algonquin Books. I was reading, you had something in an article you wrote somewhere, like um, somehow one might think that being a nurse and getting cancer is to your advantage, but at the same time, that shouldn't be a requisite. Yes. And even I, someone who knows how to work the system... I got overwhelmed by what I call DIY cancer care as in do it yourself. Mm -hmm. There was no guideline, nothing. No one looking out for me. No one saying, hey, have you made this appointment? Hey, we can help you. Nothing like that. So supposedly I knew how it worked, but I couldn't make it work for me as the nurse. And and believe me, I... I tried. I made those phone calls. I used the same voice I used in the hospital that produces results. Sometimes it made a difference and sometimes it made no difference at all. You're preaching to the choir. Not not that I was a nurse or a doctor before I got cancer. I was in college, but I've been working in health policy and I've been fucked by health care through prescription benefits and and, and, and all sorts of uh, payer coverage nonsense. And I work the system and you're still... Fuck by the system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, I also read you, you, this this whole idea of like, I knew breast cancer as a nurse, but I did. And it sounded like you felt guilty that you didn't know enough because you didn't have it yet. And I don't know if that's a burden that should have been there for you. But yes, you're a nurse. You're here to help. It's your job. And then when mm-hmm. you become on the other side of that job, are you unfit to be a nurse because you didn't know what it was like? Well, it wasn't so much guilt. There was some guilt, but it was more the feeling, the understanding that I was mortally afraid. And so people should know I had a stage one, very slow growing tumor diagnosed in fall of 2017. And I only say that because if you're going to have breast cancer, this is the kind you want. It's the most common kind. It's very treatable. And I was absolutely terrified terrified. I was taking care of patients with leukemia and lymphoma. They had very, very serious, scary systemic disease that would kill them if they didn't get treatment right away. And I did not understand that. So the point is that there were 
all kinds of glitches that I experienced, right? And it sounds like you've experienced. And as a patient, they were horrible. As a nurse, when I'd seen things like that happen, I thought, yeah, that's bad. But you know what? We're curing you. We're treating you. We all care so much about you. We make the difference. And as a patient, I realized, no, you don't. Because having a serious disease is so intense and so overwhelming. And it was that contrast that got me to write the book because I think all of us in healthcare need to work harder at understanding that patients are people. They're not on an assembly line. <laughs> they have strong feelings. They need support. And because everyone is now so focused on what they call throughput and revenue, yeah, there's not time for that the way there should be. I'm going to jump back for a sec because I, I was hearing, and again, I've been in cancer advocacy for 18 years at this point, and I worked in young adult cancer, so breast cancer in young women was a vastly different experience than breast cancer in, in, mm. in, in your 40s and 50s or whatnot, because again, just not better or worse at a different time of life, but this mm -hmm. idea of the contest... I'm worse off than you. And this idea that somehow if I was diagnosed with something worse than you, you could never relate to me. And mm. if I was diagnosed with something less worse than you, I look up to you because I feel that you're in a worse place than me. I, I was really pissed off about that. We want people to be diagnosed at earlier stages. And if not for the fortune of luck, it's for the sake of progress and recognizing how far we've come mm -hmm. that this can be a thing now that wasn't a thing. And I'm happy when I meet people that weren't diagnosed like me at stage four. Like, good for you. You know, right. <laughs> Hopefully it's, I wanted to suck less for you. Thank you for, you know, did you get a sense of that? The breast cancer forums can be horrible and vicious and territorial. Were, were you exposed to that? I made a decision early on to spend as little time online as I could, except for when I could not stop looking at mastectomy pictures. Um, <laughs> but I think a sense of that is why I avoided that. And once my husband and I were in a waiting room for some, maybe it was my MRI, I can't remember even, and two people were having that conversation. Well, I was, well, I had this problem. Well, I had... And I had, to, I had to, I told him, I said, I have to go out in the hallway. I can't stand this. So, yeah, I mean, I, I remember talking once about how hard it was for me on tamoxifen and someone said, well, I went into surgical menopause. Think what that was like. Just like, I don't want to think what that was like, you know, like, yeah, it was probably worse than what I went through. Or maybe it wasn't like, what's the point? Right. It's not. It's not a contest. We all deserve empathy for what we're going through. Yeah. You know, you don't get it. Hey, I suffered the most. Okay, gold star, you win. So gold star for you, stage four person. Like, it, why? I understand the transference. It's highly emotional. Your life is like, I, we've all been there. Like, we, we, we've all in some way, shape, or form, maybe in all of us, have faced a degree of mortality. And... Isn't that enough to level set you just being in a club where we all are supporting each other? Right. I mean, it's like I, in the book at one point I say, there's no good cancer diagnosis. There's bad and there's worse. There's terrible and there's tragic. And it's not a competition. And like you say, you know, there might be a 20 year old who got the same diagnosis I got. And it feels like the end of their life because they're young. They haven't had their kids yet. They're supposed to be invulnerable because they're in their 20s. You know, I mean, it, it just depending on who someone is and where they are in their life, it could be so much worse than what someone else feels. And why compare? There's no point to it. No, there's no point. I have several friends. I mentioned the the uh, San Antonio squad of, of young adult survivors or oncologists. And their story is like, I had to doctor my doctor. And at some point, how do you just let your doctor be your doctor without playing the role of a doctor? And you're a nurse with a doctor now. Did you have to unplug your, your nurse person, your nurseality? Have you do unplug your nurseality <laughs> <laughs> through your treatments? No, actually, the problem for me was that 
once I was diagnosed, I felt so disconnected from the nurse part of myself. I forgot what I had learned about breast cancer. I just, I, I just lost that part of myself. So that there's a whole section in the book called Nurse Brown, MIA, because I didn't know where that part of me was. But then the problem was, here I am, I just want to be the patient. And people kept letting me down right and left. So, so now with my oncologist, I, I am more of the nurse and I'm more of I'm Teresa Brown, the writer, and I know what's going on. And let's not bullshit with each other. And to his credit, my medical oncologist can totally work with that. And I am very thankful. You mentioned the diagnosis of stage one. Mm -hmm. It was that like the in situ or there was a lump or you had a mis like what was your actual diagnosis and treatment? Yeah. So it was diagnosed on ultrasound. I had a follow up to my mammogram and I was part of a study that was looking at whether mammography with ultrasound gets uh, better diagnostic results, which the study found that it didn't, but I felt like, hey, it did for me. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, right, right, know, right. Yeah. So diagnosed on ultrasound, there was no lump, there was nothing I felt, nothing. She actually also saw some calcifications in a different location she was worried about. So that was kind of terrifying. I had to have two different biopsies and I kept sort of thinking like, could I have two different cancers in one breast? And which was scary, but the calcifications were just calcifications, which are calcium deposits for people who don't know and, but can be suggestive of breast cancer, but certainly are not always. So it was, yeah, a tumor very close to my armpit. So it was very hard to find on mammogram and it was even hard to do the mammograms because then they wanted to image it. So yeah, small, so slow growing and tubular, I found out later. And the shape of the tumor cells, I think, has a lot to do with saying how aggressive the tumor is going to be and a tubular shape is good. Did you see Fat Times from Ridgemont High? Oh my God, I actually watched that like three days ago with my wife. <laughs> yeah, so I'm totally dating myself, but every time anyone says tubular, I just see Sean Penn. It's as Sean Spicoli. Penn. Yes. <laughs> my favorite line from that movie, so he's on the phone with uh, Judge Ryan Tull and he, he hits the shoe on his head. He goes, he, it's, like, it's like, dude, what's this sound? That's my head. <laughs> I love that scene. <laughs> yeah, so maybe Fast Times at Ridgemont High could somehow be a sort of metaphor for cancer treatment. Like you're going through all this stuff just like adolescence. You don't know what the hell is going on, you know? <laughs> I mean, you could always go the the stripper nurse from Ferris Bueller. And on that note, we'll take a quick break and be right back with Teresa Brown, author of the book, Healing When a Nurse Becomes a Patient from Algonquin. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. All right, now that we channel Ferris Bueller, and Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I have to get to something you brought up in the book, which is pop culture's representation of medicine on television and how they get it wrong and right. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's a group called Hollywood Health and Society. They're supposedly like the experts in guiding screenwriters in accuracy in Boston Legal or ER or, or any of the legal law, whatever, <laughs> if it's medical or criminal they're supposed to represent honesty and integrity and, and, and something reasonable, even though you need suspension of disbelief. Do you particularly pick on like a Grey's Anatomy, for example? They're, they're the easiest to pick on. Yes, they are pick onable, And I do pick on them. In fact, 
my daughter likes that show and now she won't let me watch it with her because <laughs> <laughs> she says I'm too annoying, which is fair. But the thing that really gets me is the doctors do everything in that hospital. They're always there. You know, a patient's having an emergency. Well, there's a doctor, of course, right out in the hallway. And when the patient's upset, of course, it's the doctor who goes in to talk to them. And in real life, nine times out of 10, that's going to be the nurse because doctors don't just hang around in hospital hallways because they're seeing patients in clinic or doing all kinds of other, you know, they're working. They just, they're, part of their job is not sitting in the hallway in the hospital <laughs> waiting until right, right, they're yeah. needed. <laughs> That's why we have nurses who work 24 seven and they can call a doctor if they need to. So when I get asked about this, what I say and what I've, I've been saying for several years now is, why can't these shows just have nurses doing nurses' work? Just have some nurse characters. Right. Makes no sense. And I'd be happy to help them with those scripts if they would like. Just yeah. putting it out there. Dear you know? Hollywood Health and Society, you must hire yeah. Teresa Brown now. If you're, I know you're listening. I know you're listening. Hollywood Health and Society, you're listening to the show. Because that would make me really happy. Or someone else. But, you know, just do it. Do it right. You know, you mentioned this at the top of the show, and I know it's also in your book, this idea of like, um, were you treated the way that you treated patients as a nurse and this perception or reality of where is empathy in medicine and is there supposed to be empathy in medicine and what role can it play? And this notion of do you deserve dignity and respect or do you just want to be cured, right? W where in lies the rub between you want a, a mechanic to take care of you or a therapist to help guide you through it that isn't a mechanic or somewhere in between. Yeah, and I, I wanted both without realizing that three-fourths of the way through the book, I feel sad that I didn't pick clinicians who were more warm and fuzzy. And my dog actually ended up filling that role in my life, who, you know, she is literally warm and fuzzy. But I think people need both. And that's what I found out researching the book, that Patients who are treated compassionately actually do better. They have less anxiety. They can report less pain. They need less pain medication. Now, just imagine if I had felt like someone was actually directing my care and making these phone calls for me and, and making things happen in a timely way. I would have felt so much better about everything that was going on. I wouldn't have had to take people's time calling and getting angry that things weren't happening. I mean, just there's a lot of wasted time and energy because patients are just expected to go along to get along. And a lot of patients will do that and some will not. And part of what I'm encouraging is for more patients not to do that. Ask questions. Make sure you understand. Ask if something can be speeded up. You know, our, our care needs to be on our schedule, not the schedule of the big money-making healthcare machine whenever possible. Right. I, I've talked about this particular thing on, on my show a lot, which is I call it the chutzpah factor or the moxie factor for the non-Jewish mm. people out there, mm -hmm. which is not everyone's born an advocate. A lot of people are just want to be terif rightfully terrified and subservient to what they, they just need to be told to do and don't even think to ask, well, is this right for me or is there another option for me? M my quick anecdote about this, and this is on the record for, for 20 years now, is I was a concert pianist when I got sick and they wanted to give me Vin Christian, which would give me neuropathy in my fingers. And mm. they didn't tell me that that was the side effect. They wanted to give it to me. I was lucky to have an uncle who was a genomicist who said, you don't want this. So then I went back to the doctors, I don't want this, I'm a concert pianist. And they're like, what's wrong with you? You don't want to live? So this idea of just, not being treated as a person and not being asked what's best for you is not always in everyone's you know tip of the tongue to ask that. Did you find yourself in a situation through your, this procedure where you, you weren't being treated as who you were as a person? Yeah, well, I had initially been told you won't need chemotherapy. Great. And then after my surgery, my surgeon's PA said, well, you might need chemotherapy. And I thought, what? And she seemed completely unprepared for how much that would upset me and also didn't know who made the decision or what the timeline was for making the decision or what I could do to get that decision made. And that's 
such a small example, but I, you know, I always feel like it's like saying, well, we might have to amputate your foot. Yeah. I mean, how can you tell someone, well, you might need chemotherapy. Like that's a huge deal. Yeah. It's just like something like casual aside at the water cooler, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Right. You're getting yeah. chemo. <laughs> Right. It's like, hey, John, yeah, we're moving you to the uh, Alaska office. Teresa, let's focus on your husband and your family when you went through this. This notion of the burden of the caregiver. Nurses are caregivers, but when it's your family that becomes the caregiver, again, at any level of severity, did that give you guilt to put this onus and burden on your husband and your children? Or was there an onus at all? I don't think I felt guilty. My kids were all in college, so they were older, although it was also the start of my twin daughter's freshman year. Like, I mean, I think literally they'd been students for a week or something when I was first diagnosed. And so that's really hard. The kids were very calm. And I asked my surgeon's nurse about that. And she said, well, you're calm. So they're calm. And I thought, well, okay. I, Am I calm? Uh, <laughs> but right, right. but I, I think my husband, who, who came to all my appointments and, and stepped up when I was feeling lost, I, I really wish there had been something for him because it was really hard for him. And he wasn't, I think, good at saying that because he was trying to take care of me. And, you know, we, we bumbled our way through. But I wish there had been something for him. We had a, a friend with a really serious ovarian cancer who um, actually ended up dying, but he and that friend's husband once got together and talked about, oh, our wives have cancer, but the, there's just so little for the families. And I mean, I, I told my kids, you, you can come to an appointment if you want. You don't have to. You can always ask me more. If you want to hear less, that's fine, too. I mean, I, I tried to give them as much space as possible. The really nice thing, and, and this didn't make it into the book, but after my lumpectomy, my son actually, he, he was in college, too, here in Pittsburgh, but moved back into the house for the weekend and cooked for me, and that was lovely. I mean, the, they were just so lovely throughout all three of the kids and and my husband too but I couldn't really be there for him and who was going to be there for him you also talk about your mom in the book and I, I feel like she was like the iron lady nothing affected her and she, she was yeah. <laughs> and then you know she was on some oxygen prevention and then you get breast cancer like like there's no such thing as irony like irony right can you talk about your mom a little bit yeah, well, my mom was diagnosed with hairy cell leukemia when I had just started graduate school in English. That's my past life when I got a PhD in English. And for people who don't know, that is not like an acute leukemia. It's it's a much rarer disease, and people usually die with it, not of it. And there's an, a great treatment for it. So she got that treatment after having the disease for about 10 years. It's completely in remission. But at some level, that's what led me to work with leukemia and lymphoma patients, although I didn't figure that out until about three years in, that I, I wanted to give back to the system. But yeah, also, I mean, my mom is just doesn't understand being a patient because she's never sick except for this leukemia, which also never really made her sick. And then she got this treatment and was cured. So, so right, right, right. sense of ill health is is uh not like most people's i had i had an aunt my father's actually my my paternal grandma's sister uh died at 88 of everything at once and she was just like in this homeostasis of having everything that kept her alive and it, <laughs> like invulnerable she was like made of purell but had everything inside her and <laughs> She died peacefully in her sleep, like the way you're supposed to. But this this idea of like you're invulnerable and yet vulnerable at the same time, I, I love just the idea of dying normal. But that also that I had that found that idea so hard when I, I realized I'm going to have to take a break from home hospice work now that I've been diagnosed with cancer. And that was so hard for me. I I knew I had to do it. I knew I would not 
be able to take care of people who were dying well when I was really worried about dying. But I felt like, but I'm supposed to be invulnerable. I'm a nurse. I'm right. in healthcare. We take care of the sick. We are not the sick ourselves. Something's wrong here. <laughs> and yet that's the way it was. Yep. We could do a whole other show on this particular topic, but I just love your cursory thoughts on this. Because again, it, it, it permeates society, the nursing shortage and nursing burnout. Mm. Yeah. And that is a very serious problem right now, especially post-COVID. And um, as, as you know, toward the end of the book, I, I went back to my home hospice job, which was for a for-profit company, which I said I would never do. But I thought because of the medical director, it would be okay. And, and actually, the company when I first worked for them was a good company to work for. And then they got bought by a holding company. And I think for the holding company, it was just a way to make money. And just the work itself came all about, became all about nickel and diming us, nickel and diming the patients. And that really just ate away at my sense of commitment to nursing and feeling of, I can do this job because since being a patient, I saw how painful all those small glitches are that we think are small when we're the clinicians, but are not small at all when we're the patients. And I think that's what happened with a lot of nurses. They just could not take it anymore, whether it was seeing all the deaths, whether it was never having enough people on staff. So you know patients are crashing and possibly even dying just because you're not going to be able to get into their room in time. Right. Yeah. It just people will break after a while, you know, or they'll say this job is breaking me. And so I have to get out of this job. And that's what happened. So let's wrap with one quick thing. I was also reading, you know, the, we use the term scanxiety like the last day of treatment, no matter what it is, is the worst day of treatment because like you have no idea. There's no handrail left. You're like, what next? And what now? Ah, I yeah. like that. Yeah. So scanxiety was coined, I don't know, probably in the nineties at some point I, we, we adopted it in, uh, at stupid cancer. <laughs> it's just a great, <laughs> it's just a great word to use at this point. You know, mm -hmm. how are you managing any congenital or induced hypochondria? You know, I'm doing okay. I am coming up on five years. The, magic number, even though I know it's arbitrary, because if people don't know this, most research stops looking at people after five years. So right. after five years, you're, you're declared clear, even though I, I, I'm not, I don't really know if that's based in science. I mean, your disease can come back or you could get another disease, you know, there's, there's no guarantees, but yeah, for the most part, I'm okay. And Writing this book was hard, very hard, but the process of it becoming a book and coming into the world, that was very healing for me. And then when I hear now from people who've read it, I find that very healing because they say, wow, this is what I went through as a patient. It's so dehumanizing. I'm so glad you wrote this. And and then I feel like, why well, not only did I suffer through something, but I was able to turn it into something that it seems like is helping other people. And that feels wonderful. Like that feels like a gift I gave myself, really. No, it, it's a fascinating way to, again, like I, I'm not a cat poster person and this whole lemon from lemonade thing is a bunch of shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> But um, so to, to close us out, I had one more. You, you dedicate the book to Sharon. Who's Sharon? Sharon is my father's sister and my aunt. So she died a few years ago. She was just always a very important person to me. We lived in Southwest Missouri. They lived in St. Louis. So diagonally across the state. My brother and I were good friends with their daughters, our cousins, who were sort of all roughly in the same age group. But she just was one of these people who's always generous, always kind. Uh, I mean, I remember once being at her house and got up later than everyone else. And she said, well, do you want me to make you some scrambled eggs? And I said, well, you don't, you don't have to do that. And she said, well, 
it's the easiest thing in the world. You know, just that's the kind of person she was. That's great. Um, and so losing her just felt like a personal loss, but I just wanted to honor the person she was, the person she aspired to be because she was just a model for me of, of kindness and graciousness. We're going to go out with one more dad joke, nursing joke. How's that? <laughs> Why are nurses afraid of the outdoors? I don't know. Too much poison ivy. Uh, <laughs> so I was waiting for it. <laughs> I was uh, totally waiting for it. <laughs> that's terrible. You know what, though? I love bad puns. I yes. do. So that's great. Yes. Awesome. Well, Dr. Teresa Brown, RN, nurse writer, New York Times bestselling author, the new book, Healing When a Nurse Becomes a Patient from Algonquin, Website, TeresaBrownRN.com. On Twitter, at Teresa Brown. Teresa with a T-H, like my first grade girlfriend. Thank you so much <laughs> for coming on my show. You're welcome. It was a blast. That's all for now. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Tell us what you'd like Matthew to cover in his next episode by leaving a message for us at 855-AUDIO-66, and we might just use it in a future show. Out of Patients is a product of Offscript Health. We are a healthcare engagement company built for patients and caregivers by patients and caregivers. Our executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Andrew McDowell. Our senior producer is Betsy Shepard. Our host is Matthew Zachary. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Betsy Shepard. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscriptnot.com. That's media at offscript.com. For more information, visit offscript.com.